Over the years, the Naruto franchise has racked up an incredible catalog of games, with the roster spanning over 40 titles to date. But with so many entries, some may have forgotten the origins of this lengthy series. And today, we're discussing a game that although announced alongside its predecessor, outshined it in so many ways. That game being Naruto Clash of Ninja. Two. While Clash of Ninja probably isn't the most popular of Naruto games, if you were a kid in the early to mid 2000s, then you probably understand the importance and nostalgia this game holds for many of us, being one of the first several games released to us in the West. Now, to be fair, while I have played this game as a kid, I have very little recollection of it. In fact, the only two things that I do remember are spending way too much time in this game's shop, trying to buy absolutely everything because I've always been a completionist. And secondly, the fact that this title covers what is possibly my favorite arc in the entirety of the franchise, the shooting exams. And with great impressions and nostalgia in mind, I've been nothing short of ecstatic to open the fifth gate on Gara, replay this wonderful entry, and ultimately figure out just how well Clash of Ninja 2 holds up to this day, and to come to a conclusion that I'm satisfied with. We'll analyze why Clash of Ninja 2 is such a well-received and memorable game, if it holds up to today's standards, and also comparisons between this game and its predecessor. Now, when beginning my playthrough, it's safe to say I was on the hunt for some subtle and more obvious changes they've made between the first and second game. And there was a few I picked up on almost immediately. Firstly, and to some most importantly, the major changes to the campaign, which covers a meteor portion of the original story, taking us from Naruto's graduation throughout the end of the tuning exams. To be specific, I'm referring to the Naruto vs. Gaara showdown. While for today's standards, this may still seem quite short, and don't get me wrong, Wrong. It absolutely is. Thankfully, they do make up for this lackluster length in a couple of unique ways. Firstly, the campaign introduces battles from perspectives of other characters, aside from just Naruto, which was a major issue that I had with its prequel. It was an absolute blast, playing through the perspectives of Sasuke, Rock Lee, and even Hinata, who was a welcome surprise, as her and many others help contribute to expanding the depth and length of this incredible story, even by just a small margin. Secondly, although not majorly impacting the runtime, they do incorporate some new features like team battles for instance, which in utilizing this, we get to play as the entirety of Team 7 as they battle against perhaps the most notorious of Naruto villains to date. Or on the flip side, playing as our boy Sasuke as he's now able to go blow for blow with not only Ken Kuro, but also Gara at the same time. For me, these team-ups were a welcome change as well, as they not only add some much-needed variety and diversity to the campaign, but also further reinstates to the player just how powerful Orochimaru or even Kakashi is, as we need a whole three-man team to take them on. Although briefly, they also introduce mob battles, which, while kind of bland in the campaign, is a precursor for a different mode that we're going to utilize a lot later in the video. All these new features help expand not only the length of the campaign, but also expand the roster from 8 in the original game to more than 20 playable characters, mostly due to the plethora of teams that were introduced in the second arc of the series, which in turn solves yet another issue that I had with Clash of Ninja 1. While to be fair, some of the returning characters do unfortunately feel more or less like replicas copy pasted from the original game. There are still a handful or two of new characters with their own set of moves that have yet to be explored. Sure, some may have similar patterns or combinations of inputs for certain attacks, but in terms of look, each is vastly different and works near flawlessly for each character it represents. And for the perks, each character felt like they had reason to use them to benefit you or work better with a certain player's playstyle. Except maybe Crow. I still can't believe they add this thing to the roster. Okay, alone he may suck, but with Kankuro, he can actually be kind of useful, as he not only diverts the enemy, but makes it a bit harder to lock onto you, leading to enemies missing crucial blows, and also leaving them open for attack. But to be honest, while useful, I wasn't the biggest fan. A similar yet more enjoyable character for me was Kiba, who uses Akumaru in a much more natural feeling way as the combination of their moves just mesh flawlessly together. Other characters like Zabuza, Kakashi, and Guy are the powerhouses and can finish opponents off in mere seconds. More antagonists like Gara have some absolute sick defense and long range moves, having the ability to manipulate sand from various portions of the arena. Although this can definitely be a 
major pain if you're fighting against him. Returning characters will receive some new forms as well, including an actual mid-fight Rock Lee transformation, which is insane. And for a while, I refuse to use any other character. This kid is just so underrated, in my opinion. Zooming and zipping around the battlefield, how can you not love this guy? The only downside is that, well, he becomes one hit pretty fast, but even still, it's rarely an issue as his special is just so damn powerful. And by chance you miss the initial hit, his chakra will refill so fast you can just do it again. But while this is a bit more balanced for 5th Gate Lee, and his chakra does refill a bit faster than your average ninja, I still found this to be a bit problematic for the base roster. Because as with the previous game, the chakra meter refills insanely fast. Just a few taps with the A button and you're back to full in mere seconds. But this time, the chakra meter doesn't just affect your special moves. It also affects how often you can perform substitution jutsus, as they're now incorporated into your chakra as well. Performed only when your meter is at about half full, and when timed appropriately, will teleport you behind or above an enemy, so you can execute some sick attacks. While I found this more on the fair side, as it doesn't do massive damage, Damage. The chakra meter still creates an over-reliance on your special moves, and with a tap of just one button, no less. That's not to say they aren't fun to pull off, or gorgeous looking in some cases. In fact, some of my favorites, aside from Rock Lee, were Garth's Sand Coffin because it just looks really cool. Of course, Kakashi's Chidori makes a comeback, which has some insane range. Ino's Mind Transfer Jutsu, which is just super unique and hilarious. This isn't technically his ultimate move, but Kakashi's 1000 Years of Pain always has a special place in my heart. My favorite newcomer has to be Orochimaru, who has not only one of the most fun specials to use, but also some really sick combat in general. The Long Tongue Trader isn't part of the base roster. In fact, most of the new characters I mentioned aren't. They will need to be purchased in the shop mode. Here you will find a plethora of useful options, basically everything you'd need to 100% the game. Characters, stages, power-ups for attacks and chakra, new modes, and one of my favorite purchases, additional story chapters. In total, there are 10 additional stories available to purchase. Most of these don't fall into the what-if category, but are cool little side stories, taking place immediately before or during the exams. Training flashbacks like Mike Guy teaching Lee how to use the gates. Silly ones like Ino picking a fight with Shukamaru during the exams. What a or stories that fill in some missing gaps in the campaign, like Akashi squaring off against Orochi Maru himself. All in all, I love this addition, as it does enhance replayability, adds for a great addition to the post game. And most importantly, I just love secret unlockables like this. It adds so much to the game for me. But to unlock these, however, you will need, well, money. You'll have to earn your cash, at least initially, through tedious, repetitious, one player mode. Similar to the previous entry, you will need to beat one player mode over and over and over again. But this time, even more so, as you'll only rack in 2,000 for every completion. And most characters and items will cost you a bit more than that. On the positive side, this is an excellent excuse to test out every single character's moveset and get to know them to an absolute T. And like I said, the characters are so diverse here that sometimes you'll forget you're on a mission to collect cash and you're just fighting the same 10 people over and over again. Upon completing each character's one player, their ninja files and corresponding voice tests will become available for purchase in the shop, which, like the previous game, allows you to play back little sound bites or in ninja file, read up on your character's least favorite food, stuff like that. Time attack and survival mode both make a reappearance as well, keeping the same core elements as the first, but this time resolving one of my criticisms, that being them having their own separate modes, as they are now encompassed neatly within single player. Overall, giving a much more clean and modern aesthetic, Time Attack will have you attempt to defeat 10 opponents as fast as possible, while Survival creates an environment where you only regain a bit of HP after each fight, so you have to just duke it out for as long as possible. Also, unlocking Team Battle, which is a new addition that allows you to fight 3-on-3 three -three matches, which is cool, but not my personal favorite. Upon completion of these, you will not only rack up some cold hard cash, but also be ranked by both placement and title. And you're also allowed to document this score with your initials. Upon getting these high ranks, you will unlock further secrets within the shop, like max damage for attack buffs, 
or max chakra, which are essential if you're attempting to 100% the game. This is because you'll want to utilize max damage and then continuously play through one player, preferably as Zabuza, as he has insane range and power, which helps you rack up coins as fast as possible. Then personally, I'd suggest ignoring all other items in the shop for now and only purchase characters all the way up through Mizuki. Mizuki, by the way, is just a bit more than a reskin of Iruka, even having the exact same special move. This dude cost me two hours of my life, bruh. Once you save up enough for Mizuki though, Obero mode will appear in the shop, which will, on the positive side, and your love-hate relationship with regular single-player mode, but will also ignite a brand new love-hate relationship with this mode, as it's tedious as all hell, but gets you money like four times as fast, at the least, which it better, because remember Orochimaru and how great he is? Well, he's 50,000 coins. For reference, you get 2,000 coins for every completion of regular one player. That's 25 playthroughs. Thankfully, in this new mode, Obero, you can pull well over 10,000 coins in the same amount of time. However, it is a bit more strenuous. In short, Obero has you battle through hordes of clones, which over time will become more aggressive and increase in numbers with each level completed. Fodder here will often drop items like heals to keep you going for longer, and coins slash cash, which will further increase your payout upon defeat. These items can be super frustrating to grab though, as you have to shift your character left and right to be at a very certain angle to grab it. You do get used to this structure after a while, but once the enemies start spawning more rapidly, It'll become a huge pain. To test out different methods, I did try this mode without collecting any money at all, at least none that wasn't directly in front of me, and well, the payoff was significantly less. So recouping after this disaster, my strat was utilize Demon Fox Naruto, continuously press A to decimate everything in my path, go out of my way to collect cash only, no coins, and after about level 7, I found it's best to just avoid items at all costs, unless they're directly in your path, or you desperately need heals. This is because enemies will become extremely plentiful and fast, that it will prove counterproductive more times than not. And although just as tedious as I'm sure it sounds, this works wonders. I was pulling in up to 14k or more every round, reaching level 9 consistently, which is chaos by the way. Quickly unlocking Orochimaru and the end all be all Sharingan Sasuke, who is a hundred thousand coins in the shop. Either way, racking up that cash is going to take a lot of time, but not quite the time that 50 playthroughs of regular single player would take. Also, Sharingan Sasuke is worth it. He's pretty sick. Additional post-game material includes 100%ing extras mode, which includes the aforementioned material, a gallery, and item mode to view all your purchases. Interesting. And view mode, where you can, well, view comms duking it out. All right, I take it back. They still have some pretty stupid mode selections. But before we do wrap this up, Let's briefly discuss our overall opinion on the game. If it really is that much better than its prequel, how it holds up to today's standards, and of course the overall enjoyability. My overall experience with Clash of Ninja 2 was nothing short of satisfying as well as a trip down memory lane. Taking on these classic battles and fighting antagonists featured in one of my favorite and most iconic arcs in any anime was something I'd been super excited to do ever since the completion of the original game. The story, while still being short and oddly not the selling point of the game, is still highly improved upon in comparison to the first title. Hand grinding to collect in-game cash to purchase characters, secret modes, little voice memos and stuff is something I truly miss in modern anime games. It just feels so rewarding unlocking all this extra content. The graphics, while certainly aged, hold up fairly well and some of the specials look absolutely stunning for their time period. And to reiterate, the only aspects of the game that I truly disliked was the repetitive and tedious nature of the bulk of the game. The improved but still severely lacking story mode and well, some of the mode selections again are just silly. But all in all, Clash of Ninja 2 is a great title, an absolute classic, 
and something I'd recommend for any fan of the series, or even a casual fan who simply enjoys a good old 2000s anime game from time to time. Lastly, if I had to rank the two Clash of Ninjas we've covered, that's a tongue twister. Clash of Ninja 1 would receive a 8.1, and Clash of Ninja 2, a solid 8.7. But anyway, I just want to thank you guys so much for your support. Uh, we've been crushing it lately. I'm so excited for the future of YouTube. Leave a like below if you guys did enjoy the video so I know to drop more Naruto content in the future. Also comment below on what game you want to see next, either Naruto, DBC, something else. Give me some, give me some ideas. And um, subscribe if you haven't already. Appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Peace. What a pain.